as if the basics of membrane transport weren't complex enough. When you start to consider how organisms actually implement these strategies to maintain homeostasis and grow, the overall processes can get mind-boggling. For instance, did you know that a mushroom uses active transport, passive transport, exocytosis, and endocytosis just to grow and reproduce? Or that a fish's gills use ion channels, carrier proteins, and modes of active transport to help the fish regulate its water content? Even a plant, which may seem simple, uses all the different mechanisms of transport available. Understanding how these mechanisms of transport work together will definitely be on the AP test. So, follow along with us as we cover everything you need to know about the mechanisms of transport. This video covers section 2.9 of the AP Biology curriculum, which focuses on how all the different mechanisms of transport work together to make life possible. We will start with an overview and review of the mechanisms of transport, and we will see how active and passive transport are essential for the creation of ATP in all organisms. After the quiz, we'll take a look at how these mechanisms function in bacteria, eukaryotes, plants, fungi, and animals. If you only need to review one of these topics, feel free to skip to the times outlined here. Otherwise, let's get started. This section is all about how different mechanisms of transport work together to create living cells, tissues, organs, and organisms. In previous videos, we covered the basics of the cell membrane and the integral membrane proteins that create the fluid mosaic model. Then, we looked into all the different types of membrane transport. We saw uniporters, symporters, and antiporters of active transport, and we saw how diffusion, carrier proteins, and channel proteins contribute to passive transport. We even looked at some simple systems involving active and passive transport that work together to generate ATP. In this video, we're going to start to look at how entire organisms use a wide variety of different mechanisms of transport to support individual cells, tissues, organs, organ systems, and entire organisms. These complex processes are constantly active in organisms to help them react to changing environmental conditions. Let's start with a short review of transport mechanisms and how they can work together. This is going to be a very quick review of the different mechanisms of transport before we go into the complex processes of how these mechanisms work together to maintain homeostasis in different organisms. If any of these terms are completely unfamiliar to you, or you're having trouble remembering these concepts, please review our videos from previous sections to get up to speed. Ready? Let's go. There are two basic types of transport that happen across the cell membrane. Passive transport includes simple diffusion and facilitated diffusion, neither of which requires an input of energy. Small, uncharged molecules can move through the membrane easily via diffusion. The carrier proteins and protein channels of facilitated diffusion are needed for ions and larger molecules. Remember that passive transport always moves substances down their concentration gradient, from high to low. By contrast, the mechanisms of active transport require energy to move substances against their concentration gradients. Active transport can be primary when they are powered by chemical energy stored in ATP, or active transport can be secondary if it is powered by the energy stored in an ion gradient. There are three types of active transport proteins, uniporters, symporters, and antiporters, all of which use energy in some form to pump a substance into an area of higher concentration. Further, cells can import and export large amounts of a substance through endocytosis and exocytosis. Endocytosis can take in very large objects via phagocytosis, large amounts of a solution via pinocytosis, or even bulk import smaller substances via receptor-mediated endocytosis. With exocytosis, the opposite process takes place by merging vesicles with the cell membrane. Large amounts of specific chemicals or large structures can be expelled from the cell through exocytosis. Both endocytosis and exocytosis rely on complex signaling within cells and the activation of the cytoskeleton to manipulate the cell membrane into forming vesicles that can be drawn into or expelled from the cell. 
Together, modes of passive and active transport can form systems within cells that complete incredibly complex tasks. If any of that vocabulary in the last slide felt unfamiliar or overwhelming, now is a good time to go back and review our previous videos on sections 2.1 through 2.8. Much like the ants in this video each serve a role within the colony, each of the different types of membrane transport plays a specific role in a much larger system. Over the next few slides, we're going to take a very close look at some of the complex systems in bacteria, eukaryotic single-celled organisms, plants, fungi, and animals. So be sure you understand all the different mechanisms of transport well before we continue. One of the most ubiquitous processes in life is the generation of adenosine triphosphate molecules. ATP stores energy in the bonds between phosphate groups. When ATP is used, one of the phosphate groups breaks off and the energy from the bond can be applied to a number of other reactions. This leaves a molecule of adenosine diphosphate, which can become ATP if energy is used to add another phosphate group. In all organisms, the process of creating ATP molecules uses both active and passive transport. ATP synthase, an enzyme that adds phosphate groups to ADP, is an integral membrane protein that harvests the energy present in the passive transport of hydrogen ions. For this to happen, a hydrogen ion gradient must be established. This gradient is created in the intermembrane space of chloroplasts and mitochondria and in the periplasmic space between the two membranes present in bacterial cells. To establish a gradient like this, cells and organelles need forms of active transport, like this proton pump. A proton pump is the simplest form of active transport that can create a gradient. This simple system is found in many bacteria and uses the energy created by the breakdown of glucose and other molecules. The enzymes that break down glucose put the energy into a number of electron carriers such as NADH, which can then transfer that energy to the proton pump. The proton pump then uses the energy to pump hydrogen ions, or protons, into the intermembrane space. While chloroplasts and mitochondria increase the efficiency of this process to create more ATP, each of these systems is essentially just a proton pump used to power ATP synthase. Chloroplasts simply use this ATP energy to generate more stable glucose molecules that can be stored and transferred between cells, while mitochondria break down the stored glucose molecules to create ADP on demand for the rest of the cell. Now that we have reviewed the basics of different mechanisms of transport, let's see if you can answer some AP style questions. Pause the video and complete this quiz. You can find the answers to all of the questions in this video through the quick test prep link in this video's description. Bacterial cells use a number of different mechanisms of transport to import and export substances. Since bacterial cells are already so small, they do this mostly through the use of integral membrane proteins using both active and passive forms of transport. For instance, we've already seen how bacterial cells can generate ATP using these types of transport. However, bacterial cells use thousands of different proteins to carry out the functions of life. For example, bacter bacterial cells need to gather nutrients and expel waste products in order to grow and reproduce. If a bacteria lives in a hypotonic environment, it may need to actively transport things like glucose, amino acids, and other molecular building blocks into the cell. But even bacterial cells use active and tra passive transport for more than just collecting nutrients. Consider the flagella. Even this mobility structure is driven by interactions between active and tra passive transport systems. On the inner membrane of the bacteria are a number of active transport proteins that are constantly pumping protons into the intermembrane space. This builds up a gradient which stores energy. Then, some of these hydrogens are allowed to passively move through the motor proteins. As they do so, they transfer energy to these motor proteins. The motor proteins transfer the energy in order to spin the flagella, allowing the cell to move. 
When you get to the level of eukaryotic cells, the only real difference between these cells and bacteria is the presence of the endomembrane system and the organelles found in eukaryotes. The endomembrane system is really like a cell within a cell. Consider a simple food vacuole. A food vacuole is formed through endocytosis. After the process of phagocytosis, the food vacuole is moved inside the cell. A lysosome merges with the food vacuole and the contents are digested. While we often visualize food vacuoles as simple lipid bilayers, they are in fact embedded with tons of integral membrane proteins. Some of these proteins allow ions and molecules in the food vesicle to pass out of the lysosome down their concentration gradient via passive transport. Other proteins use energy via active transport to actively move substances like amino acids and glucose out of the food vesicle and into the cell. Remember that food vacuoles are just one small example of the many different active and passive transport processes that take place in a eukaryotic cell. They are also essential for creating ATP energy, maintaining the cell's water balance, and many other processes. This may seem like a ton of information that has been squirreled away into different parts of your brain, but we're almost done. Now is a good time to take a quick break, stretch your legs, and get some water. When we continue, we'll see how these different mechanisms of transport work in plants, fungi, and animals. Plants and fungi, while they are very different types of organisms, use the mechanisms of transport in similar ways. Plants and fungi both operate on the principle of turgor pressure. This internal cell pressure pushes against the cell walls, creating a rigid structure for the organism. In order to create and maintain turgor pressure, plants and fungi have to maintain their cells at a lower water potential than the surrounding environment in order for water to continuously flow into the cell. Since water potential can be lowered by adding solutes, plants and fungi pack their vacuoles with ions and solutes using active transport. Then, using a series of aquaporins and passive transport, these cells allow water to flow easily into the vacuole from the outside. The turgor pressure that is created allows plant roots and fungi mycelium to push through the soil while it also allows for the above ground growth for both plants and mushrooms. Turgor pressure provides the rigidity these organisms need, while other active and passive mechanisms of transport allow the cell to utilize energy, reproduce DNA in cells, and grow larger. When we look at the mechanisms of transport in animals, the only big difference seen in animals is the lack of a cell wall. But, the cells must use many different forms of active and passive transport to maintain the overall organism through processes that involve multiple cell types. Animals use nerves to transfer signals. First, the nerve signal hits passive, voltage-gated ion channels in the sending nerve. This causes vesicles full of neurotransmitters to merge with the cell membrane, dumping the neurotransmitter molecules into the synaptic space via exocytosis. These neurotransmitters hit ligand-gated ion channels on the receiving neuron, causing them to open, creating an action potential, and sending the signal through the receiving nerve. An animal also needs to transport substances like oxygen and glucose to all of the cells in its body. Oxygen and carbon dioxide are small, uncharged molecules that can easily diffuse through the cell membranes but larger polar molecules like glucose need specific carrier proteins to carry them across the cell membrane. Animals also use complex patterns of active and passive transport in order to filter waste products out of their bodies. The nephrons in your kidneys are constantly, constantly manipulating water potential and ion concentrations in order to remove urea from your body and concentrate it into urine. In fact, the entire nephron is like a giant concentration gradient. Water and ions easily pass through the cell membrane in the Bowman's capsule. As they descend into the loop of Henle, they are much more concentrated regions of the nephron. Cells in the downward loop of Henle allow the passage of water, while cells in the ascending loop block the passage of water. This allows the urine to become very concentrated as it enters the collecting duct and heads toward the bladder. 
Now that we have seen how the mechanisms of transport operate to maintain different organisms, let's see if you were paying attention. Pause the video now and complete this short quiz. You can find the answers to all of the questions in this video, as well as additional resources for studying or teaching AP Biology, through the links in this video's description. Thanks for watching. If this video was helpful or informative, please like the video and leave us any questions or comments you still have about the mechanisms of transport. Be sure to subscribe to the Biology Dictionary YouTube channel to quickly access all of our AP Biology videos and study resources. Good luck!